We are counting five days to the much anticipated Jamuhuri Day 2017 the national holiday meant to officially mark the date of Kenya's independence. It is also a day on which the National Super Alliance leaders want to stage what they call the third liberation. The opposition coalition NASA has saved the date to swear in its presidential candidate, Raila Odinga. NASA is also set to host its inaugural convention on the People's Assembly same day. Certainly a packed day it is expected to be for a nation that is still settling after a long electioneering season. So is it just too much ado for nothing or will the state swearing in take place? On the program tonight, we explore the legal issues around the pending event. We'll be having a conversation with Steve Ogola. He's a lawyer in, and in his own right, a political analyst. We also have Elisha Ongoya, who is a lawyer. We hope to speak to Afula Buke, who's the director of Polit political affairs and strategy um, in NASA. So we'll be having the conversation with the gentleman. Um, let's set the stage for this conversation, though. Oh, Mahakama ilisema meweka kando Lakini tafana njia ya kurudisha hiyo ndani Iwe kakatiba na naapishwa tunaingia ikulu The contest between we the NRM and um, those who claim to be in power now is just a replay of the past and a continuation of the past those who want change and those who want to preserve the status quo using crude methods. Um, unfortunately for us now, this talk is not just about trying to advance the gains. It's now about trying to make sure that we rescue what we've lost, that we gained in the past. That's where we are. Okay, so today we do know that there are letters that have been written to several governors, um, including the governor of uh, Busia, Kisi, Homa Bay, Makue, Nikitui, Kisumu, and Mombasa as well. Um, the letters are requesting for a venue during presidential inauguration um, that is expected to happen on the 12th of December, uh, basically asking them to avail venues during the presidential inauguration. Those are just samples of uh, the letters that we have so far been able to see. Um, they have been sent out to about 11 governors. All right, so we also had a reaction uh, from David D, who's a NASA strategist, saying um, they're aware of the letters in circulation. They would not want to continue creating a frenzy of anxiety and uh, saying that there will be uh, scheduled communication from the organizing committee as and when the need arises. Okay, so let's have a conversation about this. We have in studio Steve Ogola, who's a lawyer and a political analyst in his own right. We also have Elisha Ongoya, who's a lawyer. Gentlemen, thank you so much for speaking to us on the big story this evening. Elisha, let me begin with you. So now we have uh, two let we have letters going around, um, written to governors uh, in different counties, just asking them to avail venues uh, for the presidential inauguration. Um, what are your thoughts about this particular inauguration that now NASA says will be held on the 12th um, from a legal perspective? Linda, first, uh, it's critical uh, for this debate to begin with uh, how did we get where we are. Mm. I have argued elsewhere that there's always a factor of history in the development of events and in the development of institutions. Uh, I think the country has uh, for a long time uh, played a dangerous game with uh, experimentation in conducing and entrenching uh, as a culture which can be summarized as a culture of impunity. Now the strange thing about this is that this culture of impunity has um, then led to a limit of despondency. With the element of despondency, there have been claims and counterclaims of inequity, of social injustice, of exclusion, etc., etc. To my mind, and so that uh, we don't create a whole academic thesis out of this, these, to my mind, are factors that have led us to uh, where we are today. There has then uh, emerged what has been the casus belli, that which has triggered now these events. The trigger of the events is not the cause of the events. The trigger is what finally 
brings them into action, but the cause is a long-term cause, spreading back to many say, decades uh, back. But the trigger has been the claim of electoral injustice. The problem is that elections present people with an opportunity to then choose their, a government of their choice, because one of the most fundamental rights recognized constitutionally and internationally is the right to a government of one's choice. The, with the claims of electoral injustice being planted in an atmosphere of claims of historical injustices, of claims of uh, social injustices, of claims of exclusion, then that just provided the trigger where we are now, where we are. I cannot, I have seen myself on social media, the letters are, which are about 15 in number. I cannot authenticate any of them, but my gut reading of the situation is that looking at the way the government of the day has responded to uh, attempts by the political opposition to organize meetings, to organize pickets and protestations, it may have been a political strategy to try and um, you know, disorganize the government of the day not knowing where then to mount its response from, because we are dealing with 15 different counties, then you need to rethink outside the box to be able to respond effectively in, from the perspective of government. Self, so just to point out on the real estate that what is happening in this country is, to my mind, not a joke. It's a matter that requires an important national dialogue. It's a matter that requires all the players concerned to climb down from their grand standing, to know that this country was bequeathed upon us by our founding fathers, and that we have an obligation to hand over this country to those to whom it correctly belongs to. Alicia. Not our founding fathers, but the next generation. Yes, Linda. So this dialogue that you're talking about, yes. uh, there have been several concerns about dialogue. Dialogue on what, about what, by who? Uh, Linda, I have pointed out the crisis in terms of historical context. Okay. The crisis about histori claims of historical injustices. The crisis is about claims for an exclusive, a government that looks like an ethnic exclusive clause, if you allow me the latitude. Clauses, I mean, uh, um, um, uh, 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 claims about a history of electoral injustices. A claim, claims that have driven a segment of the population to despondency, to a belief that their presence in this country does not matter, to a belief that the government of the day believes that it can dispense with them at any time on any day. A belief that the government of the day believes that it can run its affairs notwithstanding their grievances, as opposed to by redressing their grievances. This is the context that people will obviously need, whichever format the conversation text, the dialogue text, these issues must receive some solid answers and some solid reassurances that moving forward, in terms of what the future promises this country, we can have a different way of doing things. It may be very hard to convince that segment of the population if all you tell them is that it will be business as usual. Okay, Stephen, um, Alicia says there's a culture of impunity and the country has gone through a cycle of electoral injustice. And I would like to ask, is that, does that justify what NASA is planning on the 12th of December from where you sit? Uh, thank you, Linda. First of all, if you allow me the liberty to say that it's very refreshing to sit with Mr. Ngoya, <laughs> a, third of the, a third of the constitutional <laughs> dawn whose uh, intellectual influence on me is indescribable in terms of language and grammar. Oh, he's brilliant, yeah. Uh, but, in but in terms of the question that you phrased, mm. let me restrict myself to the limited aspect of this swearing-in. Article 141 of the Constitution provides that the swearing-in is a consequence of an election because you're swearing in the president-elect. Now, to the extent that Raila was not elected president, it tells you, it, significa, it, it signifies that any swearing in, purportedly so, is just designed to mock the presidency and is part of NASA's own program of action to disrupt the Jubilee administration. Which is why, to that extent, I agree with Ongoya that consultation, communication, negotiation, dialogue between Uru Kenyatta and Raila Odinga is inescapable. I believe Raila Odinga is well advised. He's a, he has a detailed understanding of the constitution himself. He has seasoned lawyers, constitutional scholars, including the likes of James Orengo. They are not fools to believe that what will happen on the 12th of December 
will be a swearing in that meets the expectation of the constitution because that will not happen. In as much as there are grievances, electoral injustices, grievances as they, as they may want to frame them, I think the proper context, Linda, is to say that NASA is determined to disrupt the order of governance for whatever reason. Now, it is incumbent upon Uhuru Kenyatta to discover and arrest the situation before it gets late. And I've said before that the destiny of this country depends to a greater extent on its ability to resolve its, its challenges in a timely manner and without external assistance. Although NASA and Raila intend to mock Uhuru Kenyatta on the 12th of December, if left unattended, what looks like a political activity may be misunderstood and misinterpreted by the supporters of NASA because of Raila's near fanatical following it may cause or occasion a serious breach of peace and disrupt the order of governance in a manner that will make it difficult for Uhuru Kenyatta to continue governance. So I plead and pray that in order to arrest the situation on the 12th of, of, of December, let Uru Kenyatta demonstrate to Kenyans that he has called Raila Odinga, he has communicated to them, because between the two of them, they know that there can only be one cent of power at, the, at, the, at a time, Linda. Okay, but you do know that NASA has made it very clear that the only conversation they are willing to have is on how to have another free, fair, credible election. Linda, maybe what I can say to that limited question, we have seen during the electioneering period that the politicians have demonstrated that they have ability to operate within the law when they want, and outside the law when they want. And I saw both Jubilee and NASA falsifying the Constitution in many ways. By way of example, NASA uh, activated Article 137 that allowed for freedom of assembly and association to picket, even at the times when the police illegally banned those demos and they knew they could move to court to, uh, uh, to retrieve an order, to extract an order, mm. directed the police to stop the ban. And even Jubilee, they pushed through electoral law reforms in a manner that was intended to preserve the outcome of the election no matter what, not necessarily caring that you can't change the rules of the game midway. So it's just that now uh, the rule of law favors Jubilee's position. They would want everyone to operate within the rule of law. But NASA, these are like CMA students. They know each other and they know that when they choose, they can, they can operate outside the law and they know that legal processes are not necessarily binding on political actors. This is something that has just been heightened during the electoral, the electoral period, but we saw Alfred Keter sometimes back, uh, the, Nandi, the, the Nandi Hills MP uh, at the, at the Gilgil Weybridge telling uh, officers that MPs make the law, they can unmake the law, they can do whatever they want. So mm. we have a system of structured impunity where the political elite believe that only you and I, Linda, and maybe perhaps the Lord Don, Mr. Ngoya, are bound by the law and are required to operate within and under they the law. Not. And for them, they can operate outside the law when they want and they're immune to legal processes. Okay. So I think the way to mediate or intervene in this circumstance is not to take lightly the, the intended mockery, but because of the unintended consequence, the disruptive nature. I think it would be better if President Uru Kenyatta reached out to, to Raila Odinga, they had a conversation and report the country that yes, I've called uh, Raila Odinga, we have communicated, yeah. we will retreat at Sagana or Mombasa or, or Zanzibar, wherever, mm. for, in order to avert what the okay. political constituency believe is a valid swearing in when we know in law that is just intended to mock the process. All right, let me bring in my colleague Duncan Haimba, who's been on this story for a while. Duncan, good evening, good to see you. Uh, let's first begin from the letters that have been seen um, doing rounds. And the one thing that strikes anyone looking at the letters is that it's not clear where this swearing-in ceremony is going to take place. Haimba, can you hear me? Can Haimba hear me? It appears to be a change of tact. Yes, yes. Yeah, it appears to be a change of tact from uh, uh, the NASA think tanks or strategists. Yes, yes, Linda, I can hear you. Uh, Linda, can you hear me? Yes, go on. Linda, can you hear me? Haimba, go on. I can hear you. 
Yes, uh, uh, from uh, what I've been able to gather is that uh, it appears to be uh, the change of tact or it's a diversion tactic from uh, NASA because uh, what NASA think tanks are doing is that uh, they've uh, decided not actually to even uh, appear before the media. Some of them, they are saying they are too busy strategizing. We managed to talk to um, one of the members of the organizing committee of the People's Assembly, David D., who said said that uh, as of now they will not be party to what they are calling as a frenzy of uh, anxiety across the country on what exactly will be happening. Therefore, the letters that we've been able to see, and I, I talked to two uh, persons at the NASA secretariat and they confirmed that indeed the letters are legit. Perhaps it's just uh, to show how they are trying to think across to ensure that perhaps they stretch the security apparatus in that uh, they don't close in on them. But I've talked to one person who is also in another team that is uh, uh, executing a totally different mandate from uh, the members that I've been able to talk to in the organizing committee and the secretariat. And they are saying that uh, they will ensure that uh, they'll do proper and thorough briefing when it's close to that particular hour on that particular day. And therefore, the letters that we've seen is exactly to keep everyone guessing as where exactly will that particular activity be taking place. And they've confirmed that as of now, unless something changes, plans are on course and they'll ensure that uh, what Raila Odinga said on 28th of November will come to pass in that he will be sworn in. Now, I put the question to that particular person that what becomes, because we know that as per the Constitution, it's only the Chief Justice that can swear in uh, anybody to become president. Yeah. But they said, because they're invoking Article 1 of the Constitution, that according to the interpretation, sovereignty belongs to the people. They've uh, defied the current uh, the order of the day, and therefore the fact that uh, they don't recognize the president uh, Huru Kenyatta as the president, the fact that they are they are they are defying order of the day, therefore they don't recognize the chief justice, and it is on that basis that they will take anyone whom they will deem fit to execute uh, what they'll say, what they'll communicate to that person, and that's why they are talking of uh, one million uh, assembly, so that uh, the numbers that they'll have, they'll use that number to bandy around and say that it was the people that gave the mandate to whoever they will call upon to swear in Relo Dinga as their president or the people's president, because they are talking of uh, people's assembly. So it's on that basis. Therefore, they will not be relying on uh, a chief justice, a person of the a caliber of the chief justice to do that because they've said they've uh, ousted the order of the day on that note. They don't recognize the president, they don't recognize the chief justice and therefore any person that they deem fit will be qualified will actually execute that particular mandate. And that is the reason why they are not even available to uh, give uh, clarifications on the move that they are taking. They are not available to even be quoted, but they are just saying that we watch this space and therefore for now it's anybody's guess. However, we do understand that tomorrow there could be a briefing by NASA principals. We are not so sure whether that again will take place or it will be again be pushed. There are those that are saying it tomorrow, there are those that are saying Sunday, but one thing that they are saying, they don't want to let out their cards right now. Of course, they know that the government is watching and they are saying that uh, it is a tactic that they want to employ. Therefore, we will not see many of them making those pronouncements between now and uh, Tuesday, 12th December. Linda. Wow. Okay. Um, Duncan Heimber, thank you so much for that update on what exactly is going on and how we got to the point that we are in as a country. Um, I'd like to get the quick reaction of Alicia Ongoya and Steve Ogola. Alicia, so the Assumption of Office Act stipulates that the oath or affirmation under subsection 1 shall be administered to the president-elect by the chief registrar before the chief justice or in the absence of the chief justice, the deputy chief justice not earlier than 10 a.m. and not later than 2 p.m. Upon taking or subscribing to the oath and affirmation under subsection 1, the president shall sign a certificate of inauguration in the presence of the chief justice or in the absence of the chief justice, then the deputy chief justice. NASA saying they don't, they're not going to work under this, they don't recognize the presidency, and by extension, they do not recognize the office of the Chief Justice. 
Linda, thank you so much. These are the sad consequences of a culture of impunity that I talked about earlier. You know, I like giving very simple examples, Linda. I, I sometimes use our highways and roads, and sometimes a traffic officer stops you because you, don't, you have not carried your uh, driving license, which is a simple wrong. It's something that you should be able to cooperate and go to court, plead guilty, and pay a small fine and move on. But if that traffic officer were to turn around and ask for a bribe from you, he becomes a criminal. And therefore, he loses the moral authority to even ask that license from you. And uh, as you respond to that, that traffic officer, you are now not responding to a law enforcement officer, core law enforcement officer. You are responding to a criminal in his capacity as a criminal. That is the problem with a culture of impunity, that then the question of moral authority disappears. Let me put it this way. I am very clear in my mind that one of the reasons why we set up a legal order was to multiply order and minimize chaos, was to multiply certainty and minimize uncertainty. So that uh, even the fact that we are sitting here as informed citizens, as knowledgeable citizens, without a clarity of mind about what will happen on the 12th, uh, where it will happen, who will conduct what, shows that there is a problem in terms of compliance with the legal order, which is a problem precipitated by a culture of impunity, which is what I want us to see. I want all Kenyans in the Asian to understand that once you conduce an atmosphere, an environment of impunity, you get inconvenienced one way or the other. There's something I call enlightened self-interest. It is in our collective enlightened self-interest as a country to combat impunity in all its manifestations so that we do not hand over to the next generation a country that ever finds itself in the present state of uncertainty. So what, I, what I've said is that it, 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 it will be, it, it, it's a sad state of affairs that we find ourselves in a situation where we have a segment of society claiming that they are going to exercise a power directly under Article 1 of the mm -hmm. Constitution as the sovereign, as the people. One of the challenges, of course, they are going to land in is that part of the prescriptions of Article 1 is that the exercise of that sovereignty itself should only be done in accordance with that constitution, meaning the procedures must be such procedures as are anticipated either within or under that constitution itself. Uh, and, and that presents, of course, um, technical legalistic arguments about how this process is going to go on. My thinking about NASA's strategy is not even to acquire um, technical legalistic presidential power, because that strikes me as a long shot, whichever way one looks at it. I think, as my colleague Steve Ogola observed, a part of this is, first of all, to bring to the fore that we are all losers when we conduce a culture of impunity. Number two, to exert what I may call substantial nuisance value to the regime installed by law, uh, I think on 28th of, uh, of, of, of November uh, uh, this, this, this year, which is a tactic ordinarily used against impunity the world over through what is called mass nonviolent mm. direct action. Okay. These are tactics that you saw being used against apartheid in South Africa. These are tactics you saw being used against uh, you know, uh, racial-based uh, di uh, discriminations in, uh, in the Americas. They are tactics that have been used in this country by the Mau Mau against uh, the oppressive colonial regimes and so forth and so forth. Once okay. you reach there, mm. the regime of the day must understand that it has been categorized in the same level as apartheid, as the okay. white supremacist regimes in the Western world, as the colonial regimes in other parts of Africa. And therefore, once you reach that category, you, all those regimes have pointed at the, law, the technical law was on their side. Okay. But the people right. said, no, no, we are not going to comply with that. It's something that we must reflect on as a country mm -hmm. and see how do you conduce a dialogue okay. that brings us out of this cul-de-sac. So this would be a good point to bring in uh, Mr. Afula Buke. He is the Director of Political Affairs and Strategy um, at NASA. Sir, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good evening. Um, I listened in to an interview you had with our Duncan Haimba, and you said that the declaration that was made by NASA leader Raila Odinga that he will be sworn in as the people's president on the 12th of December is long overdue, and that it's in a bid to rescue what, what we lost that uh, we gained in the past. Yeah. Um, so my question would be, is there no other way of doing this? Is there no other way of fixing or solving this? Um, 
first. I, I've been listening in, and the contributions are interesting. <laughs> the only angle I would like to add is this. There is the Kenya we have defined in the Constitution, and there is the Kenya we have in reality. What is the Kenya we have in reality? It's a Kenya where the Lodinga comes from Europe, uh, comes from out, is welcomed by its people, and that is disallowed. How, what does the Constitution say about that? We have a situation where people gather to come and welcome him, and they are shot. As we speak, nobody has been taken to court. As we speak, the government has not even said it can help bury those they killed. As we speak, the Kenya National Human Rights Commission has not even said this is our mandate, we're taking the government to court. Now, what Kenya do we have? It's a Kenya where we are going to the elections and an official of IBC is shot in the glare of observers of the elections. Sando is killed. Now, that is the Kenya we have, and we have the Kenya that is in the Constitution. Now, knowing these realities, what should we do? We have a situation where impunity has taken over to a point where we can have 18 people in the mortuary, 23 people in the mortuary, and yet it's not a national topic for discussion on TV. So, so what I can only tell you is this. Every human being, every society, every community, every entity has the right to exercise the instinct of self-preservation. For us, under the Jubilee administration, any attempt at enjoying any right can cause you death. This is the lesson we've gathered in the times that have been with us. And when you look back to history, what do we find? We find situations like that, where in 1969, KPG is banned, and uh, the soldiers try to do something. Any oppressed people always find a solution, a way of confronting impunity. Now we come to 1982, more bans political partisan. What do the soldiers do? do? Actually, senior private, ordinary soldiers you never have heard about. They say this is wrong. In our private capacities, we can't command anybody, very few, but we shall do something about it. That's a very holy effort by them. Now, the rest of us who are becoming mature picked up from there and carried on. In 1990, what happened? 1990s. 90 people are killed pushing for multipartism on Saba Saba. What does that mean? When impunity gets to a point where you can't enjoy any right, it is your right to choose how you die or how you free yourself. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not a lawyer. I'm more competent in quoting the Bible because I think it, the Ten Commandments, I know them. This government has broken all the laws you can think about, right from rigging elections and doing everything. Let's not confine it to electoral injustice. No, this is a long history of a cartel, a, a lineage of home guard people who want to preserve power and not want anybody who comes from the lineage of the struggle to ascend to power. You realize in 2002, they gave power to Kibaki. You think we don't know the reason? They gave him power because he is one of them. But they can't give us power. If you pick anybody who comes from that background, they'll give him power. But they can't give a descendant of Ben and Kimavi power. All they preach to us is let's move on. Now, what, what I would like to finish by saying is this. That right now, in view of the experience we've had under Jubilee, it is common sense to choose to free this country by any means or to choose to be shot. Because after all, you'll be shot anyway. Because you live in okay. your life. Those, those are very strong sentiments, uh, Mr. Buke. Um, so well, I, there's, there's a presser that was released by Salim Lon, who's the advisor to Raila Odinga. And he said, the oath that will be administered on the 12th of December will help prevent further polarization in the country by giving Kenyans hope for electoral justice. How will this prevent further polarization in the country? Wouldn't first, it make it worse? You know, first, first I think that it's important uh, to first, unfortunately, I think it's not within our, uh, our national political culture, uh, within the media, to say facts. You see, as we speak, somebody should be able to say clearly, 
that the 2007 election was like this. Somebody should be able to say that. And somebody should be able to say this was also true about 2013. But we can't say that. We, we, we like moving on. So, so, so I, I'll, I'll leave that. But what I can say is that we have a constituency that does not conform to a culture of impunity. That constituency has a leadership. That leadership needs to occupy the position that it actually ought to occupy, regardless of what these other people say. Because at the end of the day, uh, only application of uh, selective conformity to the law is taking us backwards. So for me, as far as I'm concerned, we need to really realize what will be denied three times, uh, starting with the launch of, of, of uh, uh, the inauguration of uh, the People's President, Raila Odinga. Okay. So yes. finally, before I let you go, is there any specific reason why this date of swearing in Raila Odinga, the People's President, had to be on Jamhuri Day on the 12th of December when Kenyans are celebrating Jamhuri Day? Is there um, any significance? Well, um, I, I can't really, really say. It could be, you know, we had elections on, uh, on, on the day Uhuru had a birthday. I don't know whether this was by design or coincidence. Okay. Now, now, for us also, we have 12, but I think 12 for us is just a day in which we continue our business of fighting for change in Kenya. Okay, Wafula Buke, Director of Political Affairs and Strategy, thank you so much for speaking to us on the big story this evening. So let's take a short break. When we come back, we'll still have a conversation with Steve Ogola and Alicia Ngoya, who are still in studio with me. Just basically get a little bit of reactions on um, what Buke says, um, what he has just had to say just right now. Let's take that break. We'll be back.